Peace Corps. To everyone here, and for those joining us virtually from around the globe, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the Global Connections Stories from the Peace Corps event at the Kennedy Center. My name is Darlene Grant. I am Senior Advisor in the Office of the Director of the Peace Corps, Senior Advisor to the newest Peace Corps program in Vietnam, a returned Peace Corps volunteer from Cambodia, and former country director to Mongolia and Kosovo. I am delighted to serve as your MC for storytelling this evening. We are joined together as part of the 50th anniversary season celebration of the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts. We are joined and connected by the story of President John F. Kennedy signing the executive order which established the Peace Corps on March 1st, 1961. An international and diverse network of volunteers, community members, host country partners, and staff who each have a unique service journey and story to tell we are proud that by invitation of the governments around the world, nearly a quarter of a million Americans have served as volunteers over the course of 61 years. And following little over two years navigating the COVID-19 pandemic, Today, we have over 600 volunteers in 27 countries, with 50 country programs issuing invitations. At the continued invitation of our country government partners, we are back, and we are going back better. It is the Peace Corps approach grounded in mutual respect and collaboration that has been the catalyst for some of the best storytelling in the world. Stories about transformation, transformational connection. Our stories, when told ethically and authentically, highlight the power of individual connection that allows us across all sorts of differences to see each other, to listen and to hear each other. Our stories allow for a deeper understanding of each other's experience, helping us to cultivate the patience, empathy, and hope needed to combat those things that engender hate in the world today. And ultimately, our stories of connection shine a light on a pathway to better days. Before we proceed, please join me in a round of applause for those members of our Peace Corps network who submitted stories that will not be represented on stage tonight, but are equally amazing and powerful stories to tell. Thank you. Without further ado, we are going to kick off our storytelling with our first storyteller, Brianna Maltez. Brianna served as a health volunteer in Mozambique for t from 2014 to 2016. She is actually part of a multi-generational Peace Corps family as her parents, Byron and Nancy, met in Ghana as Peace Corps education volunteers. After her service, Brianna worked in 
as a Christ Corps, as a crisis counselor for foster kids at a nonprofit in San Francisco. She also worked as a Peace Corps recruiter for three years. Her newest job is with Peace Corps as part of the virtual service pilot team. Brianna is very excited to share with you her love of connection with her story, Won't You Be My Neighbor? Please welcome Brianna. It was a hot afternoon as I watched the Peace Corps truck drive away, kicking up clouds of rust-colored dust in its wake. I was suddenly alone at my Peace Corps site in Mozambique. Just a week earlier, I and 29 others had sworn in as official Peace Corps volunteers. After three-day training with our Mozambican counterparts, we all set off for our various sites and provinces around Mozambique. For me, that meant that I was headed off to the province of Nyasa, a provincia esquecida, the forgotten province, <laughs> and the least developed province in Mozambique, or so I had been told by my southern host family. As the dust from the Peace Corps car settled, I turned and I looked at my Peace Corps house, the new place I would call home for the next two years. It was a rough-hewn one-story building with four units that shared a porch. Across the way was a larger freestanding house, and nine of us shared this yard that was enclosed by a wall and a gate. Looking at it that day, I had no idea how much this yard, this space, and these people would come to mean to me. Specifically, one of them, Vivi. Vivi was 19 when I met her, and she, one thing you should know about her, is that she has the best smile I have ever seen. It lit up her entire face, and you couldn't help but smile with her. In her 19 years, she had gathered a wealth of knowledge, kindness, wisdom, generosity, enough to rival people twice her age. She was my confidant, my unofficial guide to life in town and in Mozambique, my tutor and my best friend. And I'll never forget the day, about seven months into my service, that she told me she was pregnant. I screamed, jumping up and down with her in excitement. Amidst the jumping, she told me that if it was a girl, they wanted to name her Brianna. Oh, my heart. And as floored by that as I was, and believe me, I was, the next thing she said nearly brought me to tears. Nos queremos que você seja madrinha dela, si quiser. We want you to be her godmother, if you want. If I want, I couldn't say yes fast enough. And so, March 24th of that year, little Brianna, Brianinha, was born. And with her birth, my life as a Peace Corps volunteer shifted a bit because suddenly I had Madrinha, godmother duties. I carried her when Vivi was tired. I had her on my back when Vivi and I would go out grocery shopping around town. I learned so much from Vivi and the other women about motherhood and life and love. And about a week before Brianinha's first birthday, Vivi came to me, very serious, which was weird because it's Vivi. And she told me that as her godmother, I would have three jobs. The first, I had to pick out Brianinha's birthday capilana, that beautiful, colorful, fabric that many Mozambican women would wear tied around their waist. Second, I had to kill a chicken in honor of Brianinha to symbolize my love and ability to provide for her. Third, I had to sing a song at the party. Now, the first one was not a problem at all. The real stress just lay in picking out the perfect Capulana because I wanted my goddaughter to look fine on her first birthday. The second one, I wasn't looking forward to at all. I had been able to avoid this particular aspect of life in Mozambique for nearly two years, but it was important, it was a traditional custom, and there was no way I was going to be letting Vivi down. So I sharpened my machete, gritted my teeth, and did the deed. The third was the one that stressed me out the most. Sing a song in front of loads of people. What song would I even sing? 
I stressed and I worried and I stressed and I worried until finally it came to me, the perfect song. A hand clap song, one of these ones that goes like this, called I'll Think of You. It's a complicated one and I knew that I needed a partner. Luckily though, the biggest fan of these songs lived right next door. So I went to BB and I showed her the video on YouTube and I explained that I would, learn, I would sing the song if she learned the routine with me. Her eyes lit up, she smiled her big beautiful smile at me and she said, vamos, let's go. And so we practiced. And we practiced and we practiced and we practiced some more. My hands were red and stinging by the time we finished it perfectly. perfectly. The day of the party dawns. Vivi and I spend literally from dawn until dusk cooking and dicing and frying, cooking all the different things. The party comes, everyone arrives, there's chicken, of course. There's matapa, there's shima, there's dancing, there's singing, everyone's having a blast, and then suddenly it's performance time. I stand up, Vivi does too. Vivi hands Brianinha to her father, and we stand there looking at each other, hands poised, ready to sing. And I look at her. This woman who is now 21 with a baby and a family, she's gone back to school. She single-handedly filled me up with so much love that this town in Mozambique has become home for me. And because of her, and because of so many other people that I met during my time in Mozambique, for me, Niasa is not a provincia esquecida, the forgotten province. For me, Niasa is a provincia en esquecida, the unforgettable one. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Our next storyteller, Ella Sokuluk, traveled for three days to share her story with you. Ella grew up in eastern Ukraine and currently lives in the capital, Kyiv. Ella has two grown children in Kyiv. They are both safe and volunteering to support Ukraine. Ella is a certified psychologist with over 10 years of experience as a head of an HIV services non-governmental organization. An organization that began cooperating with Peace Corps volunteers in 2016 on community projects supporting children and youth living with HIV. Ella is now a public health specialist for the Peace Corps Ukraine PEPFAR program. Please welcome Ella as she tells her story, Hearts of Three. Hi, I am Ella. I have recently arrived from Kyiv. But this story is not going to be about the war. This story is about love, friendship, and connection. Today, I am going to talk to you about the three of us, but there are many more people like us behind the scenes. So, Bobby. How do I describe Bobby? Bobby was a tall, cheerful, and very, very intelligent young man from Ohio. Bobby came to Ukraine as a response volunteer, but was evacuated after a few days due to the COVID pandemic. I still remember seeing almost 300 Peace Corps volunteers of in the airport and heavy air full of unwanted goodbyes. In a couple of months, however, Bobby came back to soar with Ukraine as a Peace Corps virtual service program participant. He assisted a project and LGBTQI plus community empowerment, activism, and outspoken, and HIV prevention. It's through this project that we met Vanya. How do I describe Vanya? Big smile, shiny eyes, curly hair, a doctor, shy, very shy at first, but with every Zoom meeting, Vanya was becoming more and more active and outspoken. He once said, 
Знаєш, завдяки цьому проекту я знайшов своє покликання – активізм. Which means, with this project, I found the place where I belong – activism. Together with his Ukrainian friends, they eventually took ownership of Bobby's project and wanted to create an all-Ukrainian LGBTQI plus online platform for people to connect and not to feel alone. They were very, very inspired. Plans, meetings, activities, timelines, schedules. And then the war started. Bobby was continuously checking on us. He said he did not want to overwhelm us, but if we didn't feel like talking to him, we could just send him a heart emoji. The first months of war, it was a one-stop exchange of hearts. Bobby's heart asking me, how are you? My heart signaling, alive. I was very scared at first, but Peace Corps is about volunteering and support. I couldn't just sit there and do nothing. I started volunteering as a clinical psychologist with a recently liberated villages close to Kyiv. When Vanya heard about it, he started volunteering with me too. Bobby continued supporting us in the trips via our heart messages. One day, we got to a liberated village. The way was a heart along. I remember ruined houses, bridges, clinics and school with no windows, air alerts, and very strong smell of cinder everywhere. It was cold, very cold. But 50, 60 villagers were awaiting us every morning. They looked tired and very scared. It was difficult work. Every consultation, I listened to the hard stories about occupation. But I also remember that after the consultations, women, children, and elderly were smiling and thanking us. They asked for hugs. It was a lot of hugs. These warm hugs helped me understand that now we are all connected. We are our heart's connection. The war is still raging, but I promised you this story is not about the war. This story is about love, friendship, and connection, which only strengthens in times of war. And the three of us are still connected. We are our from connection. Thank you. Thank you. Please show your love for Ella. And I'm sure that everyone here sends love and support to the people of Ukraine. Next, we are going to hear a story about how the connections made by the Peace Corps impact not only the countries where we serve, but also here in the USA. Anissa Rahman is a St. Louis-based Peace Corps staff member with the Office of the Chief Information Officer, our IT shop. She also serves on the board of Sankofa, Peace Corps' employee resource group for employees of African descent. She is a crisis responder and served as a first responder during the COVID-19 pandemic including volunteering on the Peace Corps Overseas Hotline during the worldwide evacuation of volunteers in 2020. During the pandemic, Anissa served as a volunteer with the Department of Health and Human Services 
at the U.S.-Mexico border in El Paso, Texas, assisting undocumented minors. And in 2021, she volunteered with Afghan refugee families. Anissa is the founder of an art company encouraging the expression of identity, culture, and fashion through creative expression. Let's give a warm welcome to Anissa as she tells her story, Morning to Morning. I don't do it justice. <laughs> the azan, the adan, the call to prayer, it rang out every morning in the green, chilly forest of Virginia, which housed an Afghan refugee camp and called the Afghan families to come outside, to come together in harmony, to turn, to face the morning. I peered out of the window of a safe house and I watched the Afghan men walk together in stride, kicking their shoes off in the tall grass littered with cigarette butts. And I laughed to myself as I watched the crows and falcons dive in and out of the fog. I thought, maybe the birds are answering the call to prayer too. <laughs> it was beautiful to see them in harmony, especially during such a tough time. Snoring lightly on a cot beside me, slept a young teenage Afghan girl with a purple hijab tucked under her chin. We suspected her of being a child bride. For the purpose of this story and to protect her identity, we'll call her Layla. The night before, our overworked Afghan interpreter had asked for volunteers for the safe house to watch Layla overnight. And immediately, my hand shot up. I thought to myself, I need to volunteer. I can do this. I speak Arabic. I'm a fellow Muslim. I'm a black girl who lived in the Middle East during the Syrian refugee crisis. OK, this is the least I can do. I can at least give Layla one night, one night to feel seen, to feel safe, to feel known, to feel protected. And so I leapt at the chance to help her. But for those of you who may not know, like myself, our friends in Afghanistan do not speak Arabic. They speak either Dari or Pashto predominantly, and neither language is easily translated on your mobile phone. So I cobbled together my Arabic, my basic Farsi, and my rudimentary Urdu to give her a makafushi of words saying, Salaamu Alaikum, Ismi Anisa, Ana Muslima, Chetori, Chetorasti. Peace be upon you. I'm Muslim too. My name is Anissa. How are you? She couldn't even see my smile because we had masks on. So I looked in her eyes as she wept. She wept throughout the night. So I frantically searched around the safe house to find things to distract her from her own tears. I found a ball that we kicked and might have knocked the light out of the safe house. <laughs> But what she really loved is when I would draw for her. She would trace the drawings in light pink marker and smile for a moment. So I used that opportunity to teach her my name. I wrote in Arabic and then in English. Luckily, the alphabet in Arabic is the same, so we found some common ground. She lightly traced in pink my name, sounding the sounds of the Arabic letters. Anisa, she said. Oh. And we laughed, and for a moment, we knew each other. I thought, I can teach her her name in English as well. And so I wrote Layla in Arabic and in English underneath. And just again, she traced in light pink, whispering her own name, Layla. And I thought, no, no, this will not do. You cannot say my name with power, with energy, with emotion, and then shrink and become small when it comes to your own name. No, you say your name loud, you say your name proud. And that was my challenge for the night. She would say, Layla. And I would say, Nai, Nai Layla. Layla! <laughs> and 
we would laugh. We would laugh, and the worry lines in her little face would disappear for a moment, giving her some relief. A few days later, her caseworker had processed her paperwork, and she was safely departing the safe house in Virginia. I stood on the steps and looked out, waiting to hear news, and I heard a familiar voice behind me. Anissa, I heard, and I turned. It was my girl. <laughs> Layla was barreling towards me, crashing into me, colliding, and we hugged each other. We held one another. We still couldn't speak. We still couldn't communicate back and forth, so we spoke our names for all the things we couldn't say. Anissa, she said, cradling my face. Layla, I said, choking up and my heart swelling, knowing I would probably never see her again. I let go of her and watched her walk out up the green grass into the forest to her companion who was taking her to safety. For this story, we'll call him Hassan. As Layla and Hassan walked out of the refugee camp, they walked out to the edges of the green forest. They walked out into their new lives. And they walked into their new future as Americans in the United States. And just before she disappeared off into that green horizon, she turned around and looked at the fog and the crows and the men praying one last time. And then she turned. She turned to face forward, to face her future. And she turned to face the morning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anissa. Our next storyteller is Danish Karki. Danish is from Nepal, where he lives with his wife, Narjila, and two sons, Nirdish and Nirman. Danish has a long association with the Peace Corps. He worked with Peace Corps Nepal from 2001 to 2004 and rejoined Peace Corps Nepal as program manager in 2012. He is currently serving as a Peace Corps Nepal deputy program director. Danish is taking the stage to tell his very personal story about an eye-opening conversation. Please join me in welcoming Danish. Sometimes something as simple as an event or a conversation with someone can impact our lives. When I decided to rejoin Peace Corps in 2012, my colleagues at United Nations Development Program, UNDP, were shocked and surprised. They said, everyone working in the development sector dreams of working with UNDP, and you are leaving the UNDP to join Peace Corps? I looked at them, smiled, and said, you don't know Peace Corps. Peace Corps has been reciprocal learning and sharing institute for me. Many times, it has shown me, it opened my eyes, showing the other side of single story. Other times, I have shared practice and value of Nepali culture and many Peace Corps volunteers inspired. In October 2013, I was enjoying Nepali lunch dal bath with Peace Corps volunteer Nick Sung in half side canteen. We were on the top floor and we can look out over the beautiful how mountains and green forest. Nick a tall, white-skinned male with black, black hair was a second air volunteer from Maryland, assigned to serve as a food security volunteer in a small village in the western hill districts of Nepal. Nick was interested in learning about the Nepali culture of arranged marriage. Since I had had arranged marriage, 
I shared him my story. After hearing my story, he asked, Tiesa bhai, kailei bhetna bhai ko manche sanga tapai ko bie bhai hai na? Meaning, you got married to a woman that you, never, you had never met before. I said, not really. I met and talked to her one-on-one -on -one for an hour. Nick asked, do you think an hour is good enough to know a person that you are going to spend your life with? I said, I don't know. But when I first my, met my wife, Nirjala, she was beautiful, intelligent, and warm. Talking with her for an hour, I felt like I can live a life with her. In our culture, we believe if we understand the smallest particle of substance, we can understand the whole galaxy because galaxy is an extended form of particles. When I said that, I also said to him that we could understand a person within an hour. If not, it is possible that we may never understand our person entire our life. I don't know how much Nick understood my philosophical responses, but he seemed curious to learn about Nepali culture of arranged marriage. He asked, you seem pretty happy with your marriage, so tell us the secret. I said, as soon as we got married, both of us believed that we were going to form an institution that will carry our values and beliefs for generations to come. I always try to make her happy. She always tried to make me happy. In the end, both of us were happy. I noticed Nick was carefully listening to my words and nodding his head. He asked, what does your wife do? I said, nothing. She is housewife, and she does nothing. When you go in the field, who takes care of your two kids, Nirdesh and Nirman? He asked. I said, my wife. Who cooks food for the, for the family, he asked. I said, my wife, when you are busy, who represents you in the social events? I said, my wife. Hearing my responses, Nick asked, you said your wife takes care of kids, makes food for the family, and represents you in social events, and you say she does nothing? Nick's old has tossed my heart. His simple question has opened my eyes. Being a male member and raised in a patriarchal society, I realized I had overlooked and underestimated the work my wife did on a daily basis, just like a mother earth, who provides us air, water, and everything else to sustain us, but we hardly ever express our gratitude. After returning home that evening, I hugged her thanked her and said, my success would not have been possible without your support. That simple, faithful, lunchtime conversation with peaceful volunteer Nick Sung has changed my perspective and increased respect for my wife substantially. Thank you. Thank you. Finish. Next up is Kelsey McMahon. Kelsey served as an education volunteer from 2014 to 2016 in a village located in South Africa's KwaZulu Natal province. Later, Kelsey participated in Peace Corps' virtual service, work that was so rewarding that it led her to join the Peace Corps virtual service team as a participant support specialist. She lends her firsthand experience to train and support Peace Corps countries with their virtual service engagement. Please join me in welcoming Kelsey to the stage to tell her story. You are never going to make it here. When people ask me what three tips I have uh, in joining Peace Corps service, these are the three I offer. 
One, always travel with a good book and a roll of toilet paper. You will thank yourself. Two, you can never own too many buckets. There's truly a size for every purpose. And I mean every purpose. And three, don't underestimate the children. They will definitely surprise you. So like many volunteers, I distinctly remember arriving at my site for the first time. My principal, Mr. Bully, was driving me and uh, we had exhausted the pleasantries. We had gone through the get to know you information and everything had, we had fallen silent. And he goes, Miss K, you will never make it here. <laughs> And I was so thankful that it took so long to get to Mayiseni uh, that it was very dark and he could not see the fear that was no doubt on my face. And this fear continued as I started teaching. I went to school to study literature and to be a writer. I did not go for education. And besides Peace Corps uh, training, I had no classroom experience. So when I stood in front of my 27 learners in their light blue button downs and their navy skirts and their navy pants, three crammed to a wooden bench, I wondered, oh gosh, I hope they can't tell how unqualified I am to teach the future of South Africa. And I heard my principal's voice in my head, you will never make it here. <laughs> and those first couple weeks, they were rough. The kids did not want to participate, they were either scared I was Umlungu, a white person, or they couldn't understand my accent. Whatever the reason, it wasn't going well. So one day after class, it was lunchtime, and I decided I'm gonna go for a walk and relieve some stress. And I noticed some of my boys out playing soccer. I played soccer growing up competitively, and I thought, I'm gonna surprise them. So I intercepted their soccer ball made of bread bags. I dribbled it up the field and I nutmegged the goalie. For those of you who have not played soccer, when you nutmeg, the ball goes in between the player's legs. It's essentially a mic drop on the field. And while well, the boys went crazy, I saw some Peewee's eyes get big and Maja Honke and Tondo, they went, yo, Miss K! And they, then something surprising happened. The goalie, he passed me the ball. They had accepted me. They wanted me to continue playing with them. And as they started uh, relaxing around me, they started participating more. And the girls in class noticed. And then they started participating more. And then their, their younger siblings approached me and their, their family members would. I would be sitting in a taxi uh, in Inguavuma, waiting for the two-hour taxi ride back to my village. And a go, go would reach out and she would say, Miss K, I have heard about you. And she would smile. So the community was really accepting me and all thanks to these kids. One time in particular, I was out for a run and I got stopped by the police who were never in my village, uh, all because of the color of my skin. I was white. They thought she must be a spy. So they get out and they're opening the back seat of the truck. They wanna take me downtown for questioning. And I don't have my cell phone. I think, gosh, how am I gonna contact Peace Corps? How am I gonna get out of this? Maybe Mr. Bully is right. Maybe I'm not gonna make it here. And <laughs> a little six-year-old comes running out and she bravely looks at the two police officers who were concerned for the community and she's, she rattles off who I am, why I'm there, and it's crazy, I know, but she actually enjoys running. She's not running from anything. She just runs and says, Gikutanda Ukugajima, as she just runs on by. And the police looked at me and then they got back in their car and they left and I didn't see them again. So in short, I, encourage you, if you find yourself an outsider or a foreigner in a new community, don't rule out the children because they might just surprise you and be the ones to show you that you can make it. Thank you.
Thank you, Kelsey. Our next presenter joins us having traveled from Madagascar. Irzu Ramana Talun. Irzu has been, has been with Peace Corps Madagascar for 12 years. He first started in 2010 as a temporary language and cross-cultural facilitator and became health programming and training assistant subsequently. Earlier this year, he was promoted to Madagascar programming, health programming and training uh, specialist. Irzu has a long record of promoting diversity and equity in Peace Corps Madagascar and was recently elected as the program's Intercultural Competence, Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Committee Chairperson. He has also been involved with Grassroots Soccer Program since 2019. Irzu often shares a quote from Gandhi to inspire Peace Corps colleagues and volunteers. The best way to find yourself is to lose yourself in service. Please join me in welcoming Irzu as he tells his story, Small Portions, Big Hearts. Manaona, which means hello in the Malagasy language. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm gonna take you now to the heart of the Malagasy hospitality. The story happened back in 2000. 13, in a very beautiful village, which is called Mantasu, where our Peace Corps training center is based as well. It's a very typical rural area of the highlands of Madagascar, where you can see in one hand, men working on big grass fields, oftentimes with their cows. And in the other hand, you can see women bending down almost half of their legs in the muddy field, planting rice seedlings and forming long straight lines. Besides, you can see forests of pine trees and eucalyptus, and those beautiful red mud houses scattered all around the village and some on top of the hills. And most especially, the village is by a very gorgeous lake, which makes the great reputation of the area. It's calm convivial, but cold as well. So during one of those freezing mornings and inside on one of those beautiful red mud houses took place as well my regular Malagasy language classes. In a small room with some old wooden chairs and from the inside you can see the firewood smokes coming out from the upper small window of the neighbor. And there was a trainee his name is Steve, and he lived there with his host family. Steve was one of the three trainees that I was taking care of when I was still a language and cross-culture trainer. Steve is a tall man with a big beard, looking towards me, very intimidating. But when he got very close, he sparked a very big smile and telling me, hey, Erzu. I think my host family really loves me. That's awesome, Steve. Could you share more? And Steve said, do you remember the first time when we got picked up by our host family at the schoolyard? And when we came home, the rest of the family was already waiting inside the house, lining up, and each of them shook my hands and gave me three kisses on my cheeks. So in the space of one minute, I got more than 20 cheeks on my cheeks, and there was really blossom. And I said to Steve, yeah, that's the way we Malagasy people greet and welcome our guests. And not only for foreigners, but even between us, between families, between friends. When you receive a blessing or when you make a great achievement, that's the same way we congratulate the same person. And Steve said, oh, that's really awesome. Yerzu, that was not the only cool thing happening over the weekend. You know, they killed a very big chicken for our first lunch, and they gave me almost half part of it with big amount of rice, 
with some lettuce, with some good foods. And I said, yeah, Steve, that's the way we Malagasy people receive and welcome our guests. We do everything to offer the best food ever. And Steve said, oh, that's really kind. And I could hear some great feelings of joy, excitement on Steve's voice. And that was like the same feelings, atmosphere in our class every day over a couple of weeks. Until one day, Steve came into the class with a very gloomy face. And I knew immediately that there was something wrong going on. Steve didn't particip participate at all in the language activities. And I was very concerned. And I took time during the language break to approach Steve and said, hey, Steve, is there something wrong? Is there something that I could help? And Steve was a bit hesitant at the beginning, but he ended up telling me, hey, Arzu, I think my family has changed. It seems like they don't love me anymore. What made you say that, Steve? And Steve said, you know, over the last uh, three days, we had not enough meat anymore, not enough eggs, I miss the first times, I miss the good foods. And I could hear in Steve's voice some mixed feelings of deception, sadness. And I said to Steve, hey Steve, I'm really sorry to hear that. But as a Malagasy person, I think that might not be the case. Now you're treated as a member of the family. The family shares what they have with you and you're not treated anymore as a guest. And family bond is priceless for Malagasy people. Ladies and gentlemen, there's a Malagasy proverb which says, which means we prefer to lose money than to lose kinship. And which implicitly means as well, kinship and family connections are worth far more than anything else even the best Malagasy food ever. Thank you. Thank you, Erzu. Our next enthusiastic and heartfelt storyteller tonight is Aisha Harris Parker. A member of our Global Peace Corps family, Aisha is from Jamaica. She is married to Rohan, and they have five children. Aisha joined Peace Corps Jamaica in 2007 as a language and cross-culture facilitator. She is now a full-time language and cross-culture coordinator and has been serving in that capacity for seven years. She is staff lead for Jamaica's Communications Committee. Please give a warm welcome to Aisha as she tells her story, Taliwa. We are small, but we are strong. What are you going to do with that? That's Jamaican for, what are you going to do with that? This is a question many persons asked me as I studied linguistics, language, and Jamaican culture in university. There were even some people who would say to me, you will never get a job using that. But they were so wrong. I started working at Peace Corps Jamaica in 2007 as a language and cross-culture coordinator. This was my opportunity to share our local language with the world in an organization that understood the connective power of language to help us to engage persons and to meet world peace and friendship. This was a lofty concept to me at the time because our country is literally a dot on the map. But then I remember the Jamaican saying which says, we're little but we're talawa, which means in English, we are small but we are strong. And then I it started to make sense to me because I recognized that all our volunteers will go out and they will learn the language and then they will use the language to make connections. I remember 
when our country was celebrating the 100th birthday of our cultural icon, Mrs. Lou. And the Jamaica Language Unit reached out to Peace Corps and said, will you participate in this event? I said, of course. And I called four of our volunteers who were advanced Patwa speakers, and I asked them, are you willing to participate in this event? And they were willing to rise to the challenge, and they said, yes. So I said to them, listen to this idea. How about you create an original dub in the Jamaican language and share that with the audience? Now, a dub is poetry, usually done to music. In this case, the conga drum. And they said, yes, we will do it. So they wrote their original piece, and they went ahead and prepared it. And the moment came for us to go and perform it. So they gathered, and we went to the University of the West Indies for the event. When we arrived, it was a large lecture theater full of people. Everyone was here to celebrate this monumental event, and the volunteers were scared. I said to them, don't be afraid. Do what you practice, because you're Talawa. And they went on the stage. As they stood, the audience was a little tense, but they started, Wagwan! This is Jamaican for, hello, what's going on? And the audience erupted in laughter and claps, and everyone was excited to hear what the volunteers had to share. They had made a connection by using the Jamaican language with the people. One audience member shouted out, why you not live? Which is Jamaican for, where do you live? And a volunteer said, Bakabush, which is Jamaican for, in a very rural area. The audience was amazed, not just at their ability to use the language, but at their ability to understand what the audience was saying. Nelson Mandela says, if you speak to a man in a language he understands, you speak to his head. But if you speak to him in his own language, you speak to his heart. Peace Corps understands the power of the heart language and the connections that can come as a result of people using this language to speak to each other. A Jamaican proverb says, one, one cocoa full basket. And this simply means every one that you put in will eventually full your basket. And this is a power of Peace Corps globally teaching language. Each person makes a connection and each person takes it back to the world. So Peace Corps, like Jamaican, little but them Talawa, because they understand the power of the heart language. Thank you. Thank you, Aisha. In closing, please join in another round of applause for our storytellers as they return to the stage. event with the knowledge that at minimum your story will make someone laugh or cry but at most your story could be the spark that leads someone to apply to serve as a Peace Corps volunteer. Thank you and our, our storytellers will greet you at the back of the chairs Good night. <laughs>